today I'm talking to John Chowning and you are mainly known for being the inventor of FM synthesis, right? Well, I prefer the word, the word discoverer. Discoverer, okay. Yes, because uh, nature had provided it, it was already there, but uh, it had not been revealed itself, let's say, because it was absolutely counterintuitive to everything that uh, engineers knew about, you know, frequency modulation. So let's talk a bit about your background. What's your background? How did it all start that you were discovering it? Well, my, my, my interest had been music since childhood. And uh, so I pursued music in, in high school and then in the military service during the Korean War, I was a musician. And at that time, there were some exceptionally good uh, musicians who would have been drafted. So they, like me, uh, joined the military and, and played music instead of holding guns. And uh, then after my military service, I went to, to a university and studied music theory, composition. Following that, I went to study in Paris with Nadia Boulanger. That was in 1959. And um, so while studying in Paris, I was there three years, there were opportunities to hear new, new music. At that time, Paris, I would say, was probably the center of, of uh, Western, modern Western art music. And that's one of the concerts that was very important to me, uh, was a series actually, that Boulez had initiated called Domaine Musical. And uh, these were maybe five or six concerts a season, I don't remember which. But uh, at, at those concerts, I heard electronic music for the first time. And uh, then there was GRM in Paris, the Coupe de Recherche Musicale, which also had concerts that were you know, throughout the season. So it was my first exposure to loudspeaker music, that is, music uh, that was composed uh, for loudspeakers, that rather than the use of loudspeakers to rep give us some representation of a concert venue, or, which is the other, and primarily remains the, the primary use. So that was very, very interesting to me. The thought that uh, one could make loudspeaker cones move and and produce sounds that were not part of our natural world. So when I studied with, uh, having finished or decided to stop studying in, in Paris with Boulanger, I went to graduate school at Stanford. And uh, here I inquired about the possibilities of electronic music However, there was no facility and no interest. Then I happened to read an article by Max Matthews that was published in Science, the, the uh, journal Science, in November 1963. And uh, it was given to me by a fellow percussionist in the orchestra who was a biologist by training. So, uh, she read, read science and cut the article out and gave it to me, okay. which I read, and it really got my attention. The way uh, Max Matthews described the, the process uh, suggested, and as I understood more and more, turned out to be true, but it suggested that one could bypass all the complexities of electronic gear, let's say, stuff, cables, wires, generators, filters, etc., if one could learn to program 
and generate the samples directly, uh, given a digital analog converter or a loudspeaker or some converters and loudspeakers, I could presumably, just with learning the program, uh, produce sounds that any that uh, were basically unlimited, in, and so I pursued that. Taught my, I took a programming course, and uh, in this winter of 1964, and went to see Max in the summer. He gave me a box of cards, which were the cards which were the Music Four program. Came back to Stanford, and with the help of a young math major hacker, in in those years, hacker a hacker had not the negative connotation which it has today, but was someone who's deeply into computers. And he taught me what I needed to know, and advanced my programming skills. And he uh, we got someone to build a DAC. Well, actually, I used as a DAC. A digital analog con converter. I used a PDP one's uh, 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 XY ladder on the on the on a scope of display, and so X was channel one and Y was channel two, and I did my first experiments in localization on that system. And in 1966, uh, well, the PDP-1, I should say, was part of John McCarthy's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in its incipient stage. And a year or two later, in 1966, they acquired a uh, PDP-6, a large uh, research machine with 36-bit words. PDP-1 was a small 18-bit word machine, but we used it as a, as basically as a buffer and, and converter. Then we had someone build a digital analog converter for the, for the uh, PDP-6, which then was shortly replaced by a slightly um, better or more advanced model called the PDP-10. Uh, this was Digital Equipment Corporation, which no longer exists, but. Um, and we began developing um, the ideas. I stumbled upon the F frequency modulation synthesis in 1967. And uh, in 1968, I had a, a quadraphonic system going with four converters and uh, built by a young engineer. And so we had a very quite advanced program, all online. It was a timeshare machine, so, so one show. I was about to say, yeah. Uh... Yeah, we had to. Well, I was only allowed to use it in off hours, in evenings and weekends. So uh, in the middle of the night, there was very little competition, so I could get lots of compute cycles. So that's uh, how it got how it got going, and, and FM turned out to be, well, I was looking for signals that would localize in in a kind of a 360-degree uh, projection, spatial projection. Uh, I had <clears throat> gotten from uh, journals, well, actually, Max Matthews' colleague, Manfred Schroeder, uh, developed an uh, all pass reverberator, and so I assembled a reverberation reverberator for for this system. And I needed a signal that would uh, differentiate differentiate itself from as a direct signal from the reverberant field. And so, so one of the primary w ways to do that, of course, is by small changes in pitch. So as I was modulating a sinusoid, as beginning, starting with the idea of vibrato, I realized, well, the computer didn't have any limits, I, as a hand does, or a void vocal track does, and the vocal folds and vibrato rates and depths, I just kept increasing them, and uh, 
this was these were discrete steps, so it was not I couldn't had no control in real time. So I would generate a second or two of sound and then wait ten minutes for it to compute, then listen to it, and uh, then make another step. At some point, at a point, I realized that I was not hearing uh, modulated. I was not hearing uh, kind of in the in the pitch domain, in the time domain any longer, like, <laughs> but I was hearing uh, spectral changes and complex, a complex tone, and uh, so this caught my attention because I knew that to to generate such tones with the only other means in that day was additive synthesis would have required lots of oscillators or a complex stored waveform. But so I kept notes and wrote down what I was and did a kind of systematic exploration of ratios of the, what I called then the carrier, well, I didn't call it carrier, free, center frequency and, and vibrato rate, which of course is carrier frequency and modulating frequency, and then the depth. So I have three parameters, plus time, of course, that I played with and realized there was a there was something beyond uh, what the eye could see, the ear could see, here in this case. And uh, so that was the discovery. It was not a mathematical discovery. I had then showed this what I had done to to my uh, young math major friend, and he said, "Well, let's go to to a radio engineering text and see what how it is how it's explained." And uh, in radio engineering texts, they use a simple case to explain what is really very complex. So, a sinusoid modulating a sinusoid produces sidebands and. And we know the rest of the story. And uh, so it was counterintuitive to everyone. I mean, Max Matthews, John Pierce, everyone, John Claude Vissé, everyone was surprised because uh, I was generating a FM signal but not demodulating it, just using the modulated signal directly to form what turned out to be very useful spectra. So basically, that's the story. It sounds a bit similar to um, what Forrest Moser told me, how he did it when he invented speech synthesis. Yes, maybe. It's it's a similar process. Because yes. some stuff he explained sounds very similar to what you just told me. And the ear was leading it. That's the important thing. It's the most important tool, finally, really was... Uh, being able to listen carefully or having a musical view toward, toward listening or I guess can hear sort of inside sound. So that was uh, very important. So for example, when you had, when you had an interview at the Computer Chronicles with Stuart Strafe in 84, you demonstrated like a very deep man voice that was deeper than a human voice could be. Yes, that's right. Uh, that was um, work that I did in 1978-79 when Jean-Claude Visset had invited me to spend a year at IRCOM in Paris. And uh, I decided to try and synthesize the singing voice. So that was turned out to be very successful. It was never exploited by Yamaha in in the uh, in the you know the FM series of instruments. Yeah. So the the singing voice was very success, successful, and um, you know the the idea was to assign a carrier frequency to the harmonic closest to a desired format frequency, a resonance, basically, and the modulating frequency was, was at the pitch frequency. So that was a way to, with 
with relatively small index values on each carrier, you could get get a, a kind of the effect of a resonance. And uh, so that was very realistic. And then the basso profundissimo, as I called the bass voice that you make reference to, uh, I simply modulated the modulating frequency to get more uh, more complex and therefore more sidebands to, because in the lower in the vocal range there the density of the of the harmonics and the voice is much greater of course so that piece led to phonic which uh, was inspired by Jean-Claude Bisset's uh, work Mutations, 1969, one of the, I think, most important pieces of music done in that era, because it opened up a, a view of possibilities that could only can only be done by by computers, having to do with uh, uh, creating spectra that also include the, the, the pitch domain, the pitch material. And that was new, that was novel, and I think very important. Then I exploited that idea in Fonet, and uh, the, the, the piece that I wrote more recently, um, Voices, and so it's a, a very important moment, I think, a piece of music, and I think led to to spectralism, kind of one of the roots of that, the French uh, movement, and of also Stria preceded that, since 1977, I think that was a piece that was very important also. Yeah, we have to take into account those were different times back then. I mean, in the 70s, even in the early 80s, people thought that computers were evil. And also in that Computer Chronicles show, you explained, no, you think that um, the synthesis is making music richer and not, uh, I think you said, dehum dehumanizing music. Yes, yes. Well, that was the first response by a musicologist at Stanford who said, you're dehumanizing music. And I said, well, I hope not. I'd rather think about, about it in a different way that, we're, that I'm uh, humanizing computers. And uh, so there was a, a wonderful moment three or four years ago when uh, the, the opening of the Bing Concert Hall there was a performance of music that was composed for the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul and was reproduced in the, in the Bing Concert Hall with a dome of speakers that, uh, so the, the Karma staff, uh, Fernando Lopez Viscano primarily had assembled with, with uh, control and programs that Jonathan Abel, had, had, an electrical engineer, had had uh, created a model of the Hagia Sophia based upon a few balloon pops and frequency sweeps. And uh, I thought to myself, well, because that music cannot be performed in the Hagia Sophia any longer, but not since, you know, centuries, because it's, uh, it became a mosque and then became a secular, during, after Ataturk became a museum, so no performance is, is allowed there. So I thought to myself, that music college does, colleges now can listen to music that was composed for music that he was surely interested in, in the Byzantine era, can be performed at, at 7,000 miles away in a concert hall where the acoustics of the original are more or less, and actually quite well represented. So I thought that's a, a great contribution that we can capture you know, models of, of a space and then transport it anywhere because our technology is so 
so has advanced. So, in fact, I actually per performed a recording of that piece in Linz uh, several years ago at the at the opening of the electronic music studio in the Bruckner University. So from Istanbul to Stanford and then 7,000 miles or whatever, and then 5,000 miles back. Pretty impressive with what we can do these days. Yeah, I guess it all started a bit to reach the masses when you licensed the technology. Or no, it was, I guess it was the university itself that licensed te technology to Yamaha, for example. Yes. You, you mentioned it earlier in a, in a side sentence. Yes. So um, at that time, this was 1972, I think, when, when Stanford had a, it's a, sort of a, a very, at an early stage, what they call a technology licensing office. And I knew that this had some value because the quality of the tones that we were, that I was able to generate were much better than electronic organs of the day, of course, which were all analog. So the Office of Technology Licensing looked at the obvious candidates like Hammond and Wurlitzer and, uh, you know, others, none of whom understood the digital domain. And uh, Yamaha's presence in the United States at that time was primarily just pianos. And, uh, but uh, a, a researcher in the business school who had been given a project to by a student discovered that Yamaha was the biggest producer of electronic instruments in the world, primarily organs in Japan. And so they sent an engineer to look at what I was doing. And in 10 minutes, he understood everything. Because they were already doing research in the digital domain, so he he got it, and quickly they took options for a license so that Stanford wouldn't offer it to anyone else for a period, so they could make a an evaluation. Of course, there was no one else, in fact, who who had any interest because no one just understood. But uh, anyway, that was the beginning, and. And uh, the rest, I guess, is history. They, they did about 10 years of research before they had, because the technology at the time they began in the, in the early 70s, the, the scale of integration was not such that they, there was any hope of producing, producing an instrument that would be affordable and small. But they saw the future. They knew about Moore's Law. And uh, so with some faith and a lot of really good engineers working uh, with me when I would visit it uh, maybe 10 or 15 times over those years and give, give them what I, I knew. And uh, so there was a, a lot of insight, I must say, that Yamaha had that allowed them to finally produced uh, the DX7, which was their most famous instrument, but certainly not the most profitable. The most profitable in those years were their organs, where they implemented FM. The synthesis, you know, that was kind of in the popular music world, so that's why it became so well known, although it sold a lot of instruments, there's no doubt about that. I think this, the FM synthesis engine was the largest synthesis engine that's ever been produced still. And uh, of course, sampling now is, is, is the way most people generate music. But uh, yeah, those was a very exciting time. And uh, the DX7 is not my invention. That was about a hundred really good engineers working hard for a long, for many years. And, yeah, but uh, you made the root discovery that made it all happen. Yeah, that's that's true. But and also what what we learned very early about the value of FM pitch scaling and, and making 
a pitch height a fundamental uh, consideration in determining things like modulation index and whatnot, so that you could easily scale index as a function of pitch height was a very important to Yamaha because they saw that that uh, the sampling or the, the aliasing problem could be reduced because at the first, when they were doing their experiments, they did not have high sampling rates. Uh, finally, the DX7, it was quite high. I think it was some odd 57 kilohertz or something. Then the DX7 II was 48 or 44.1. I forget what one of the two, but then it was the standard. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of, of kind of know-how that I had uh, developed over the years since the night, since its discovery and and the, when Yamaha started doing its mock-ups and breadboarding various versions of FM synthesis. But it didn't stop with, with pianos and Yamaha. It was also that your uh, discovery led to this FM synthesis using in other areas. For example, the C64 was the first home computer that had a synthesis chip, if I'm not mistaken. The SID chip in 82, or for example, the Yamaha chips were also used in the Mega Drive from Sega in a video game console. And even in arcade machines, they had oh. FM synthesis chips. So yeah, it was right. even used in video games and arcade games. Yeah. And you know what the finally the greatest use was? Cell phones. Right. Okay. When uh, up, up through until a few years ago, I think that was the, a little very simple FM chip was used for ringtones, especially in Asia. And uh, well, then as the microprocessors became more powerful, I th think they do it all now in software, but, or, yeah. That's true, Perfect. yes, yes, yes. You had, like, synthesis-generated ringtones. Yes, but um, it was a huge market for, for Yamaha. And uh, so that was, but then the patent had run out, so Stanford no longer uh, received any income after 1994, I think. So what's your opinion to know that your um, discovery was used in video games and home computers and arcade games? Because, you know, a lot of people think that video games, computer games and so on are a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't, you know, spend so much technology and knowledge in generating video games. What's your personal perspective on that. Well, I don't, I'm not a video game player, but so I don't really have an opinion, but I'm not against. And uh, I think it's kind of a, an idle uh, question, really, because we know they're not going to go away. There's much a part of, of people's life to, lives today is uh, as almost water, I guess, for the young people. So uh, it was good for Stanford because the, that produced income, and that income, most of that income supports Karma, you know, Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics. So that, from the point of view of licensing technology and having it used in, in entertainment, uh, no problem. They're perfectly happy. Chris Chafe has done some interesting sonification work using my FM voice algorithm from 1978 in the medical school, where they use it. To use uh, he uses this voice al algorithm to to highlight changes in say epileptic, epileptic seizures and the brain waves and whatnot. So that's easily, uh, you know, a marketable idea. A marketable idea because it's noble, and uh, that it's in, used in medicine. Well, so if it's used for for music, new music, 
uh, electronic music. I think that's also important. That has to do with another part of human experience, which is, which is, uh, you know, a, a mode of expression that was that is unique, and so that it's used by composers and that makes me very happy. I use it still for my work. And uh, video games, they can be wonderful ways of relaxing. So I'm not certainly not opposed. And creating cognitive skills that uh, I suspect are probably very useful, although that's a study that I haven't made. I'm sure people have. But uh, it's only when video games, I guess, become addictive to the point that they exclude the rest of life where one wants to scratch one's head and but that can that can happen with all sorts of uh, you know, sensory input that need not be so that's a more general problem that's uh, has really not to do with video games I think yeah, I, I see you have a very open mind about everything. That's very good. I guess well, you I need to be, because you had to defend your discovery back in the day where everybody was like against you. Well, in the early years, that's true. Um, but we're all friends now. Dave Smith and Oberheim and Moog when he was alive. Uh, yeah, we. that was a brief period when the DX7 hit the market and no one's bought any more keyboards because with that came MIDI and it was a powerful synthesizer, the first widely used, uh, widely produced digital synthesizer. So yeah, there was a lot of troubled faces in the analog synthesizer world for sure. Yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned MIDI, yes. I remember that in almost every interview that Stuart Chaffee is doing, he always mentioned that every time they had like MIDI in the show, everybody would say, oh, we are not going to get home because this never works at the first try. Yeah, yeah. So Dave Smith's contribution was a very great one. And uh, he has now a very successful com company in San, in San Francisco uh, with the old profit line but, and some of the the, uh, the inner synthesis part are analog but of course it's all digital controlled but it turns out to be a very good business for him uh, Dave Smith Instruments I think it is it was uh, what was the original company that sequential circuits maybe that produced the profit line, I don't remember. Maybe sequential circuits. I guess it can be read online somewhere. I don't I don't know right now. Yes. Um, so in the end your discovery was used in a lot of ways. And um, what was for you the most exciting way of of it being used? Well, my own work, I mean, that's the way I use it is not like, not as most people use it, but I know it sort of intimately. So I think I'm able to exploit it in ways that, uh, that um, are not so well known. Most people kind of think about it in, in the mode that it was and the extensions of the early uh, DX7 modes and whatnot. But uh, it's extremely powerful, and it's kind of a small universe in the universes of music production and most of the, the ways that, uh, for example, having to do with simulating resonances that have not been exploited by many composers, as far as I know. I guess auto-tune that is used nowadays has also something to do with the discovery you made, right? Because a lot of people use that to have like a better voice, but it makes yeah. the voice 
a bit robotic if it's used too much. Right. So one of my famous uh, demonstrations, which I, when I give talks, is the singing voice without any modulation, say the micromodulation of a mix of periodic and aperiodic, small amounts. And uh, with the introduction of the kind of instantaneous in introduction of the micromodulation, the spectrum, which until that point is absolutely static, is magically becomes a soprano. And it's a, it's an exper it's a, a sample that I generated in, in Paris when I was working, working with, uh, with Jean-Claude Risset. And uh, it really is the original auto-tune, in fact. <coughs> Kind of, yeah. So in order to, they just they just freeze a waveform for a number of periods and then then release it, give it back to the voice. It's pretty simple, and and you're right, it becomes robotic. But it uh, it be, I don't know why it's so popular. Maybe because because the difference between the auto voice and the singer's live control, live voice with all its, its dynamis, dynam, dynamism, it's so strikingly different. And uh, it shows that these small, these small amounts of modulation, some of it is not controlled by the singer, it's just natural error in the vocal, me vocal mechanism that it be, how important that is in what we call liveliness or, yeah. <clears throat> so let me ask you, what are you working on right now, no, right now, nowadays? Nowadays, I'm, uh, I have two pieces that, that uh, actually three pieces that are in mind. One is a keyboard piece based upon uh, this idea of, of what, what I call uh, structured spectra, creating spectra that uh, we can only do with a computer where it conforms to complement, say, the pitch domain. So the pitch domain, frequency domain can interlink as Jean-Claude first did in Mutations, 1969. Um, and I have a piece that I've sort of begun having to do with some Peruvian underground galleries and uh, sort of spaces that maybe 3,000, 2,000 years before the Inca in, nor in northern Peru, uh, the interest there is in, in creating models of spaces that have sort of uh, proto-cultural importance. You know, before cultures became part of our antiquity, but there were there's a periods like as we know in the Chauvet caves in France or, and where art was produced in the prior wall, you know, the prior paintings in Chauvet, um, that certainly had deep meaning, but it's not explicitly known to us. The horses galloping on the wall, on the walls, of, drawn on those caves, and uh, one wonders why they were positioned there, for example and not somewhere else. Well, there's some speculation that maybe the acoustic properties of that particular this part of the Chauvet clave, the cave, which is a vast complex, uh, was suggested, for example, of um, images which then they, they produced on the walls, like two stones put together, maybe produced echoes, and that kind of like galloping horses, um, so we don't know, 
So it's very mysterious. And uh, these Peruvian caves that are that they're called Chavin de Huanta. Chavin de Huanta. C-H-A-V-I-N. That's uh, a Stanford archaeologist has has kind of been supervising the the work there. And he had the idea that these galleries were used for sensory manipulation. So I read about it while I was working on a piece having to do with the Oracle in Delphi and the implications of the Carician caves above Delphi. And uh, I proposed to him that we get engineering people at Karma to produce a physical model of these underground these underground galleries and, and, and corridors so that he could hypothesis test. And he was very excited and that work led to a PhD. My interest was to be able to use the acoustic model of the underground spaces to produce a piece. And the coke, coke shells, strum, strongest trumpets, of the, which are were found there. So there was uh, some interest in, I have in creating a piece for maybe French horn and strumpus trumpets and in this underground space. So that's one piece. And another is uh, I'm currently interested in some underground caves in China, uh, Long Yu, L O N G Y O U. They're, they're underground, very mysterious grottos that were uh, excavated two to three thousand years ago, for which there's no explanation, no one. But they're huge, enormous. So I visited in November, and uh, we did some bo initial balloon te pop testing to get kind of a rough profile of the acoustic properties. And I'll go back, I think, in April to do some more specific. Again, the ideas, two ideas, principally to to capture the the acoustic properties before civilization, culture demands that they put in support structures and walkways everywhere for tourism, because that means that we've lost the original acoustics forever. Then secondarily, and the Chinese government is very interested in this and supporting this work that we can do concerts there. So we can wow. take down loudspeakers. I've been interested in the cavernous spaces since my youth and uh, they carry, I mean, big reverberant caves are the first places that that humankind ever probably heard polyphony, where you, with long reverberation time, you could make a sing a tone and then sing another tone and accompany oneself. And, uh, so they they have a, some sort of deep magical attributes, I think, that are very attractive and which we preserve in monumental architecture. And I remind myself of that uh, the great cathedrals of Europe were not built only for the stained glass windows, but also because of the acoustic properties and the music that's so much a part of that ritual. So, they're an extension of our early experience, I suspect, in, in natural cavernous spaces. So to find one in China that's huge and uh, and kind of articulated surfaces that uh, for which there's no explanation and was very, very interesting. And I must say, I was awed when I first went into these these uh, grottos, they call them. Well, actually, you can you can get some f pictures of these yourself. Just Google Long U grottos or Long U caves, 
China, and you'll get some beautiful photographs that several websites. But they're largely unknown. They've only were discovered in 1992. And when you see how how large they are, and the, the implied effort that it take it took to to uh, excavate these caves, and for which there's no reference in the any records of that were kept by the. Chinese people who meticulous record keepers is just absolutely surprising. Well, the problem nowadays is, and even was back then, knowledge is getting lost over time. Yes. You know. Well, the digital domain can help that, I think. But for example, you said you learned to code for for your discovery, and nowadays a lot of people don't know a sampler or something, you know. Yes. Even that is being lost. Perhaps, yeah. But you know. there were very, there were certainly more people who code these days than there were when I began. That is, people who are in the arts are able to code. So it's not, I, I think it's the fact, the, the point is that the, 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 the wide use of this technology and the the proportion may be decreasing, but the actual number is probably increasing of people who code and who are working in the arts. I guess I guess third knowledge is becoming a niche knowledge. Only few people know. Well, I mean, one of the great things about a platform like Max MSP is that uh, people who make contributions to to the patches that become part of all, you know, made available to all of us. Many of them have no academic background at all. They just learn to program and it kind of became, they became swallowed up in the luxury of and richness of the environment that they consider a small computer and do all this stuff and just by learning how to put stuff together. It's kind of a miracle in a way that, uh, yeah, I mean, some of the great, you know, two up, you know, Randy Jones, I don't think he was a programmer. And he did some great things for it. That's true, yes. Well, yeah. here's another question. What's your opinion about emulation? Because especially in the sound area, emulation of um, synthesizer ships sounds pretty bad. Emulation, are you saying? Emulation, yes. Yeah. For example, emulating old sound analog chips. Uh, sound chips. Yeah, analog sound chips. It never sounds hundred percent correct. Never sounds really right. Like r trying to emulate a. A, a synthesizer from the 1960s or 70s. Ex exa exactly, yes. Well, they're getting pretty good at it. We had just had a PhD uh, complete, uh, student complete work on an, uh, on the, the old drum machine sound that is indistinguishable. And uh, if you Google Kurt Warner, I think it's the German spelling W-E-R-N-E-R -E -E or maybe W-A-R-N-E-R -E but uh, he did an absolutely uh, brilliant PhD that emulates this uh, old drum machine sound. One of the famous ones of the 60s and 70s, I forget the name. And uh, so the, the the knowledge, the engineering skills are, are really a hot topic. That's a, and it's, it's pretty, pretty high level engineering mathematics, in fact, signal processing. So I don't know, I haven't, I don't know that world, so I can't comment, but 
I do know that there's at least one case where it's been very successful, and he was hired immediately by Sark in in, uh, in uh, Belfast by the university, Queen's University. So he's on the faculty there now. So I think. There must be some things that are moving. But isn't that kind of lose, losing the charm? I mean, for example, when you had um, a keyboard or a Commodore 64 computer, every sound chip sounded a bit different. Nobody sounded, al no one sounded alike. Yes. And nowadays, every so everything sounds exactly the same. Isn't that that's, kind of losing the charm? Yeah, but you, that's because people accept it. And uh, I mean, one of the most important attributes of the FM for Yamaha, it was that that uh, the relationship of force and tempo change. So, uh, what is it they call touch control? No. Uh, the feature of a synthesizer where the force with which you strike the key has some effect on the on the sound. So just coupling that to modulation index was one of the most attractive things when we first presented FM to Yamaha because they could see that a good keyboard player who had very fine touch control from years of training, say on a piano where that's critical, could distinguish him or herself from other not so skilled keyboard players because of their uh, their motor skills in manipulating the uh, velocity key velocity. So um, that people don't make the distinction. You make a distinction, obviously, because you you just noted it. But people who use these things, if they uh, required them, then the manufacturers would provide things like velocity control on the keyboard to to change the quality as a function of strike force. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I just noted that because, like, I had like twelve computers, and every everybody, uh, everyone would sound different. So, you know, and. The layman wouldn't know that, for example, you know? Yes, that's right. A lot so, of knowledge from the 70s and 80s is just available right now, thanks to the Internet. Yes. Well, isn't that what uh, someone like you does, is to make public, uh, bring to the surface some of these aspects of current knowledge and current Current uh, practices that that uh, you can provide insight toward through publications and online. Yeah, that's that's the whole point, maybe. Or one yeah. of the points. Well, I just noted that a lot of knowledge is just lost, and a lot of people are just not knowing who created things that we have nowadays and why and how did it happen? Because yes. nowadays it's like you have it mm -hmm. and how it came to be doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes, that's, that's, that's true. The history becomes dim. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of creators like yourself is putting a lot of meaning and emotions into something. For example, when I was few, when I was interviewing Forrest Moser, who invented speech synthesis, he mm -hmm. said the thing that he liked the most about his invention, the best moment in his life was when he when he did the speech of the Ghostbusters game for the Commodore mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. for the Atari, and he's and he had to say like. He slimed me. Yes. And that he found pretty funny, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. And um, I guess even for you, that you have been invited to the Computer Chronicles and being on 
public television and everybody is watching you. That must have been very exciting for you. Um, the actual, the, in fact, the popular music use of of F um, in the early years. I mean, I it wasn't my world, so um, you know, I was certainly uh, awarded, you know, like Yamaha's Man of the Year, and I go give a little talk, and there be a lot of interest, of course, in, in the years just after the DX7. But it wasn't my world, so I didn't have a very strong reference and uh, that was, you know, embedded in my own personal kind of uh, cultural roots. So it didn't have the same impact as, say, uh, having a really good piece of music, say, at Earcom that was made using it. That excited me a lot. That was very, because I heard it used in, a, in the context that, that I understood. I, I, I don't mean that I was insensitive to its popular use. In fact, the first time I heard a DX7 wasn't in, in Japan. But my wife and I had gone to a movie and stopped to have a beer in a, in a place that had a kind of a piano bar. And the pianist whom I knew beckoned me over and he said, look, listen to this. And on his piano, he had a DX7. Well, I had never seen a DX7 until that moment. And this must have been, you know, months after they were first produced. And uh, I had heard it, of course, in prototypes in, in Japan, but it was never, I had never seen the completed, the completed machine. So he played it for me. I thought, gee, I know some of those type of sounds. I've heard them before. But, you know, that was a nice moment, I would say. So this Actually, is why you prefer to call yourself a discoverer instead of an inventor or pioneer? Yeah, I mean, FM was a discovery. There's no, about, no doubt about that. And, uh, and it was, for me, the most important thing about it was that it was a musical discovery. It was not looking at an equation and saying, well, we can do this. In fact, I gave a lecture at the University of California, Berkeley, to a class of engineers about FM, and the uh, professor, who was a famous electrical engineer, after I had played the vo voice sounds and brass sounds, all the various sounds, that he said, you know, I could sit and look at that equation for, for who knows how long and never imagine that we could make sounds like that. And I said, well, that's the same for me. I could not either, and because that's not how it happened. You know, it's that I found, I discovered it using vibrato. And uh, it happened, that it was explained by FM. So that that's a, a really important point about why it's a discovery, because it's there, nature, it's a, property of nature, FM vessel functions are used by astronomers and, and uh, you know, material membranes vibrate and, and certainly many, many aspects of, of the scientific energy, engineering world are inhabited by vessel functions. So, but they exist in nature. So do you think of it like if you weren't the one who discovered it, somebody else would have later? It's an interesting question. And I, of course, people have speculated. I think that because I did not have real time control, that ex computer time was very, very expensive. So I had to think a lot about what my next experiment, next one second sound would be. And after, depending on the number of users on a time sharing system, it could have been 10 minutes or it could have been 20 minutes. But, and the fact that they were discrete. So I listened to a tone based upon the set of parameters and then made a change and listened to another tone. 
And in listening to it, I'd listen carefully. Now, had I had a real-time control, say a, a joystick or something of the day, and moved the carrier modulating frequency continuously through the frequency space, I may have missed it. Because it would have just sounded like you know, comp, some sort of complex modulation. But the fact that I hit on these points where the carrier frequency, the modulating frequency, were the same frequency, that was so in revealing about the, cap the capacity of this technology because I heard the harmonic series. And just by changing the depth of modulation, I could create the effect of a filter, you know, a filter whose bandwidth is changing in time. What that sort of sound. So I knew immediately, okay, well, this is, I'm using two oscillators and I'm hearing things that would be evaluated in Fourier analysis, probably having 20, 40, or 50 oscillators, depending on one number, and that was the modulation index, which I called pitch deviation at that time. So I guess the point is that um, the, the conditions under which I was working were such that allowed me to, to take the time to really understand with my ear what was going on. And I mean, modulation theory was certainly well understood at Bell Labs. Max had a, had, and Jim Tenney, who had written an article about, about uh, the Music 4 program only a year before I began, uh, actually had the same instrument defined, which, uh, which I used to, to do the first FM uh, examples. So sometimes we know too much. And so I was naive. And uh, I didn't have this, uh, this understanding of FM having a carrier frequency in the megahertz and you demodulate the modulated signal to get an intelligible signal. I had no idea about that. So I, I, uh, there was a famous uh, phrase by uh, Louis Pasteur, I think he made in 19, or 1856 or something, um, basically saying that dans le champ de, de investigation, le, le hasard, um, let's see, what is it? Unfortunately, I don't know French. Okay, well, in English, it's a chance favors the prepared mind. And so I think in my case, it is the counter statement. My mind was not prepared, and therefore chance favored the naive mind. In fact, what he, the actual phrase is chance, he says chance favors only the prepared mind. And uh, don't, in the, you know, the field of scientific investigation. So Max knew all these things. Pierce knew all these things. When I first played played that, played my examples for them at Bell Labs, they were astonished. And John Pierce looked at me intently and said, "Patent it." Great. Well, he was the director of research at Bell Labs in those years, and very much interested in music research and and allowed Max to pursue his interests in computer music. And this was the moment where you recognized you had something big. No, I knew before. I oh. knew that. And I think at about the time, 1971, when I produced the brass tone, brass-like tones, that, that this was exploitable. I just had no idea how, because I didn't know about the, or, but I knew that there were electronic organs, and that would probably be something of interest. So I, I knew that there was, there was value because I knew Jean-Claude's work was 
probably the most elegant synthesis of the day, was based upon um, many oscillators, each of which had independent control over pitch and time. And he produced some beautiful, beautiful tones using that kind of add additive synthesis. So I knew that 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 uh, with two oscillators producing the tones that I was able to produce was certainly uh, 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 an advance. Couldn't do everything that exactly what he was doing, but equally lively and and uh, with the internal dynamism that our ears expect in the natural world, at least. So your um, well adventure into computers, learning to code and so on, that was all to s support your discovery. To make music, yeah, to do things that I could not, could not, I could imagine, but could not produce. And of course, it's it's not a process of imagining some sound at the end point. That's not how it works. You imagine an idea about a sound. If I could do something like, and then in my head I have, and then I start to work for it, and then sidetrack, and, and probably usually end up with something else. And uh, But along the way, I learned so much. The most targeted, uh, I would say, experimental process was the voice tones, the singing voice. And I learned so much on the way about the details of hearing and what constitutes liveliness in the sound, and how to control it. So in doing that, I, from that came phoneme, which was a, just a, a kind of abstract idea based upon Jean-Claude's opening in mutations. And uh, so then it, I pursued it and sort of I'm chasing, I'm chasing an idea. The computer gives me something that I wasn't expecting. And that melds with the idea of my original idea to produce a third, you know, kind of target. Then pursuing that to the it's kind of a complex feedback where the horizon of possibilities gets ever greater as one works through the process. But the computer has always been very active in my feeling about its use. It's not a passive device that I instruct. It's the, the richness of programming languages and I mean, like Strio is based upon uh, an idea of, of recursive procedure. Well, when I saw that in the sale manual, the language that I used was Stanford Artificial Intelligence language. It, I saw in the manual, this procedure is also can be a recursive procedure. So I asked a computer guy in the AI lab, explain to me what that means. And he sh showed me what recursion means in a simple equation. And uh, then he explained how it could work in as a as a procedure, and how a procedure could be can recursive. So immediately I saw, well, I can use that in a musical way. I could create a music structure with pitch and loudness and and spectral division, and I can take that structure and embed it through a recursive call in the procedure as one of the elements of the structure, I have this mini structure kind of within the structure. So that that was immediately uh, led to a rich idea that had important musical values. So in Stria, at the kind of climax, I used more and more recursion through lots of calls on the procedure that creates this kind of uh, spectral spectral mass and uh, so it's all structured it was all preconceived but many many thousands of data that are generated by the computer to produce those sounds which came out of designing procedure and music using it in, in its recursive form as well so i mean programming languages are unbelievable uh, 
and re- unbelievable sources or manifestations of about thousands and thousands of years of human thought about thought. And uh, so it's like poetry in a way. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Well, I mean, this this all created a generation in the 80s of musicians that learned to code because people who coded programs and games and so on, they didn't know anything about music. Mm-hmm. So a lot of uh, composers I interviewed from the 80s, they told me they actually had to learn code to enter that business yes. and helped coders who had no idea about music because suddenly to the synthesis, synthesizer ships, music in computers became so complex that you had to know what you are doing. Yes. Good point. Yeah, yeah so you. the number of users has increased. And you're probably right, as I said before, that the, the proportion of people can code is a, is a smaller um, part of that proportion. But the actual number of people who code is probably increasing. Well, mm. I guess also it differs because back then you learned like assembler, which is also called machine language. And nowadays you are more object based or web based. Yeah. You're not really coding hard to the processor, directly to right. the processor. Yeah, that's right. The first language I learned, however, was Algol. And then the, that was what was taught. That was seen to be the language of the future in about 19, 1960s, early 60s. But the actual language that I used to, the working language and the music, when I started music, using music for, was Fortran. Fortran, okay. Yeah, which is not, a, it's not so distant from, from machine language. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's a high-level language, I would guess. But anyway, to, once you learn that, then going to other languages is not difficult. There, yeah, you understand. There are sure. many options. But uh, the, the basic thing that was so attractive initially was the idea that if I could learn to generate that series of samples and make the loudspeaker, that was so attractive because I had no engineering skills or knowledge. I wasn't a ham radio operator, but I wanted to do this music that I, I wanted to create sounds in space and the thought that I could do that just by learning to program, that was really important. You control something. You control yeah. the discovery you made. Yes. And I guess yeah. it was a way harder back then to learn like machine language or Fortran than nowadays. Yeah, probably. I mean, there are all, all sorts of online instructional applications that I guess that help one along. But it finally it's all pretty simple. You know it's bytes and uh, manipulating data. Well, well it's really... I guess it all depends on your point of view. Yes. I know a lot of people who would say computers are so complex and how a program works is so complex. You know, it all depends, I guess, who you ask. Yeah, yeah. systems are complicated. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, managing a system at, the, at Karma. Fernando Lopez Lascano, I mean, he, I don't know how he does it, but it's so complicated. You know, managing emails, managing, you know, all the program options and keeping it all straight and keeping everyone happy. It's, uh, it's amazing to me. So within the, the frame in which I work, which is the actual music making, that I understand. Like Max MSP, I'm pretty good at it. Although 
it moves so quickly I hardly know what the latest options are, whatnot. But but I can get done. In fact, when I began working on voices in 2004, I, I decided to use Max MSP because I wanted to make it interactive for uh, a live soprano, my wife, uh, for whom I wrote the piece. So I learned Max MSP as I wrote the piece. So I would do write these little patches to do certain things I needed to have done, and then would discover that, well, there's an object or a patch that, I, what do you call it, a, yeah, object that actually does it. I didn't know about like uh, Uzi or something, you know, fire off. Of, so you did it yourself because you didn't know. Yeah, and and uh, because I didn't know, and then I decided, well, I better take a course, get some some kind of basic level. So I took a summer course. At, uh, actually, it was only a, a week course, but I, I learned a lot in a week at University of California Berkeley that David Wessel had. Uh, promoted or put forth every summer. That's something actually that I discover a lot when I interview tech pioneers or discoverers. They never stop learning and they never lose interest in learning nowadays new stuff. Well, that's the nature of art, isn't it? We don't retire from art or music or, or whether it's audio, visual domain. We just keep doing it because we love to do it, and uh, and it's expressive. I mean, I, I'm much more comfortable playing you music than talking to you, but I realize the value of, of articulating ideas in natural language. And Hopefully, I ask the correct questions. Good, good, good questions. No, I enjoyed it very much. I only know a glimpse, you know, of what you um, actually discovered. So, but it went nice along the way. I've learned a lot. Yes, and I have enjoyed it too. Actually, it's interesting because, as I said before, it's very much similar to speech synthesis from mm -hmm. Forrest Moser. So it's very similar. So I had an idea of what you were explaining to me. Mm hmm. Good. Right. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Bye for Bye. now.